Alright, so to start off, do you, should the NCAA allow schools to make admissions decision, decisions? Yes. Uh, admissions decisions have to be an individual school uh, decision. Uh, there's no way the NCAA can uh, step in and perform the admissions process for all student athletes at all 1,000 plus schools. Uh, the NCA has uh, minimum eligibility requirements, but to be admitted to a university, every school has to be able to apply its own standards. You know, um, you can't have the NCA making a decision about who gets into Harvard as well as who gets into the University of Memphis. Two schools that have very different academic aspirations and expectations for their incoming class. So that has to be an individual school decision. Okay, so in the case of Memphis, where they said that someone took the test for Derrick Rose, do you think Memphis should have been allowed to say that he did not need to require to take the SAT? Or do you think, uh, how do you think that should work? Well, the issue there was that uh, the allegation was that somebody other than Derek Rose took the SAT exam. Mm -hmm. Now the SAT exam is not administered by the schools. That's administered by the uh, organization that owns the SAT exam. Okay. Um, so, so the schools are at the same disadvantage that the NCAA is. And the NCAA and schools work cooperatively with those agencies, that, the ACT and uh, the SAT to look into fraud. Fraud is a, a standardized test fraud on college entrance exams is a problem for student athletes and it's a problem for the general population. There's students trying to get into college that have that engage in test fraud. So Derek, that's not a unique issue to student athletes. Uh, so really, the, all parties did the best that they could under the circumstances. They, they, it, it takes a while to, to get to the bottom of those fraud sort of uh, cases. Uh, there's a lot of, um, it, it depends on, on the, the evidence that was collected, the proctor and you know, um, whether they checked IDs uh, adequately at the test site on the test day and, and what sort of video uh, might have been available, uh, what sort of signatures might have been on the exams. There's all sorts of things that, that uh, anybody um, would have to look into. And so Memphis, uh, the NCAA, the testing service, they all got to the bottom of it as, as fast as they could. So if they were all working together, then uh, why did Memphis have to receive sanctions? Well, because once it was determined uh, that, that uh, Derek Rose had not in fact taken his SAT exam, that automatically made him ineligible to have competed during that one year that he was at Memphis, okay. which meant Memphis played all of its games that year with an ineligible student athlete. So they had to forfeit all those games because they had an ineligible student athlete on their roster and a significant contributor, obviously, on their roster the whole year. Okay. That never should have stepped foot on the court because he didn't take the, he didn't pass the minimum requirements to, to be entered in the school. So do you think vacating all those victories um, and their NCAA uh, tournament victories, do you think that is a fair sanction for Memphis? You know, it, it's, it may not uh, be as much of a deterrent as people want it to be, but it's the most uh, it correlates the most directly to the violation that occurred. Mm -hmm. You played with an ineligible student athlete, the school shouldn't benefit uh, from that. Uh, and when it comes to NCAA tournament appearances, there's significant uh, revenue distribution that's involved as a part of that. So um, that's, 
that does carry some significant weight. You shouldn't be allowed to, to march through the NCAA tournament, earn a ton of money from the NCAA revenue distribution plan for your conference using ineligible student athletes, and then just say, oops, sorry, uh, please hand us our check now. I mean, there's, there's got to be some consequences for using ineligible student athletes. Okay, so then they, I, I read they had to give the money back to the tournament that they uh, gained from that. Mm -hmm. um, how, how, I'm trying to think of the word, how effective or how big of a hit does Memphis take from not receiving that money? It, is it a significant hit for the program? Oh, yeah, yes. Uh, you know, Memphis isn't a, isn't what you consider uh, uh, probably middle of the road in terms of budget. And so that's, that's a meaningful percentage of their annual budget. Okay. The revenue earned from that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you think, another thing that happened in the Memphis case was they were providing Derrick Rose's brother for traveling expenses. Do you think schools should be allowed to pay for families to travel out to games or to uh, postseason appearances? Well, now they do. Okay. Now in, uh, in the college football playoff and the men's basketball tournament, uh, the final four, um, schools can pay for parents to travel. Okay. Uh, Was that made? That's very recent. Okay. That, that, that started last year. Did so it happen it because the there were a lot of cases where families were getting paid, or is... no? Because that that was a violation at that time. Mm -hmm. I mean that that uh, that's known to be a violation. They they were intentionally violating the rules. The that that rule change that occurred last year was more in response to a growing expectation that that student athletes need to be provided more benefits. Uh, of a financial nature, and one of the things that could be provided is uh, expense money to help parents go see their uh, kids play in some of these high-profile games, and so that's something that they instituted. I think I think with the college football playoff last year, so it was in place for the for last year's uh, basketball. Okay. Um. Which sanction has been the most effective for the NCAA in, in general, would you say? Because they all obviously have their specific um, conflicts that they go with. But Yeah, I mean, uh, any sort of financial penalty is, is going to be the most significant. Scholarship penalties are also very significant. Uh, anytime uh, you, you take away scholarships as part of a penalty that uh, puts a team at a competitive disadvantage because uh, a coach can't recruit as deeply as he could have if he had full scholarships available. Does that affect the current team or only for future recruits? So for well, basketball if you have what 12 scholarships and they cut it to 10, let's say. So do two players on the team lose scholarships, or can they just not give scholarships to recruits coming in the next year? Yeah, they, they, it wouldn't strip two scholarships away from a, from a current student athlete. Okay, Correct. so it doesn't affect current teammates. It just affects the team they and that they won't get better talent, another, potentially. Yeah, with another scholarship. Okay, yeah. so then kind of going off that, this is a more general question about sanctions. Mm -hmm. Does the NCAA try to shy away from sanctions that'll hurt the individual players or are they for example like vacating wins or championships when the players might not have been involved in something the coach or the program was doing have they been trying to shy away from that or do they not really well th th there's there's been an ongoing struggle within the committee on infractions to to find the most appropriate penalties for each case. And every case is different. Uh, the facts are unique to every single case. Mm -hmm. So it's hard to compare one case to another. But uh, the, the committee struggles with that idea of are we penalizing innocent people? 
but it's difficult to craft a violation or a, a penalty that 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 can can ha have no impact on the innocent, so to speak, mm -hmm. and all of its impact on those who were guilty of committing the violations. So, anytime you you penalize, you you have to penalize the program somehow. And in because the school ultimately has to take responsibility for the actions of its coaches, its employees, its student athletes. So part of the violation, the, the penalty process is the, um, the, the underlying policy that schools are responsible for the actions of those within their program, within their athletics program. Mm -hmm. So if that's the case, the school has to pay a price and that price may involve vacating wins, uh, ineligibility for postseason play going forward. But without that, what incentive does the school have? They need to, I mean, yes, it'll penalize future student athletes who don't get to go to a bowl game or a postseason uh, basketball game. But the, the committee's had a very difficult time finding any, any alternative penalty that perfectly fits. By the time this penalty was discovered, Derrick Rose is gone. He's mm -hmm. in the NBA. He's no longer under the NCAA's jurisdiction. Uh, the penalties, the, the violations that occurred were not tied, could not be tied directly to John Calpari or any particular coach. There wasn't enough evidence to link any coach with knowledge of this. So you can't penalize an individual coach for it. Um, and even if you could, the school still has to take responsibility because there has to be some incentive that the school knows if we, we need to be very careful with these eligibility decisions because if we aren't, as, a, as an athletics program, we are gonna suffer a penalty. Not just, we can't just push it off on our coach. We can't just push it off on our student athletes. We are going to suffer. So that creates an incentive to get things right on the front end. Okay, so my final question is to go off that then. What is a solution or how can schools prevent uh, ineligible players from joining their roster? Like, like mm -hmm. Memphis worked with NCA, and once they found out, I mean, it was kind of too late because Derrick Rose had been playing mm -hmm. the whole season. So how do they prevent something like that from happening? You know, just like with any uh, admissions decision, they're kind of, kind of at the mercy of waiting for the testing center to possibly bring test fraud to their attention. Um, but their schools need to be, um, I would say, to, to try to avoid those situations, schools need to proceed with caution and a certain level of suspicion. So let's say you have a situation where a student athlete took an entrance exam twice and got a consistently low level and then suddenly took it a third time and had a dramatic jump. Now, one possibility would be the school could say, great, we've got the score we need to get this student admitted, let's uh, push him through. The other, the, 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 the policy that schools should follow is, okay, we have a, a score now that we can use, but we have concerns about this uh, person's score, and so we're gonna look further into the circumstances behind how on earth did this score jump so much. And that, that's where the process gets slow because um, they have to request uh, cooperation from the testing services and the testing services have to go into the tens of thousands of exams and look into the circumstances behind this one uh, student's test score. And so it's a process and you have to be, you have to take time with that process because 
you have to give the the student the benefit of the doubt say hey until we find evidence of foul play we're not going to sit you out but we are going to keep looking uh, at whether this is legitimate or not so anytime it comes to test scores jumping or the same thing happens in high school records a student will go through freshman sophomore junior year of high school with a low gpa they haven't accomplished many of their uh, core courses yet and suddenly in their senior year they achieve a ton of college prep courses with the grades required to get into school that those schools need to be responsive to red flags mm -hmm. and that's where I think the, the lesson is for schools is proceed with caution. When there are red flags about a student uh, getting admitted, um, you need to, to turn over every stone, uh, f run out every possible concern that you have about the legitimacy of a student's academic record and uh, make sure that you are confident that you can stand behind that academic record uh, in order to allow them to represent the school in competition. Okay. It's a long answer, yeah. but, but, Perfect, there, though. but, it, but it's, it, it is a responsibility that the schools have. Yeah. Ultimately, they are responsible for certifying the eligibility of the student athletes that they allow to take the court or the field. And so they have, and, and there's a process for it. There's a compliance office on each campus. There's a faculty athletics representative who is supposed to be checking the eligibility of, uh, that the compliance office signs off on. And so there's supposed to be a system of checks and balances. And, and ultimately, once that roster sheet is signed off on by the compliance officer and the faculty representative and the athletics director, then that school is certifying we we believe beyond uh, any reasonable doubt, basically, that uh, everybody that is on this roster is eligible to compete. We stand behind that decision. So they need to have adequate processes in place and adequate personnel to look into everything. Okay. Some schools don't have enough compliance officers or their faculty representative isn't as engaged in the process as he or she should be or their admissions office, their compliance office doesn't have a good line of communications with the admissions office to uh, discuss possible red flags like this. All of those different groups on campus need to work cooperatively in order to be as effective as possible. Okay. 